Well, I'm Temple Grandin. I am a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and a specialist in animal behavior. And I, I was severely autistic as a child. I had no speech until age four. I knew I was autistic. I, the one thing that I didn't know was that my thinking was different. And I talk about that in, in this visual thinking book. You know, when I was building those jobs, signing those jobs, I thought that everybody was a visual thinker. And it was a shock for me when I was in my 30s to discover that other people thought in words. That was a shock. I learned that in my late 30s. But the thing is, different ways that you think bring different approaches to problem solving. To enhance these different ways of being, we put Temple's words of wisdom into these five themes. She talks about awareness, acceptance, accommodation, appreciation, and advocacy. Let's begin with awareness of the autistic experience. Different approaches are crucial to the growth of a society. Here, Dr. Temple Grandin describes three neurodivergent thinking styles. In autism, you can have three different kinds of, of um, extreme thinking styles. Uh, I'm an object visualizer. Everything I think about is a photorealistic picture. Then you have your pattern, mathematical thinker, music, computer programming. So some autistics are the mathematical type, and there's others that are the art and mechanical type. And I've been very interested, uh, our airport at one time had a whole lot of Japanese art on display, very intricately carved. I think it might have been made by somebody who was autistic. A lot of people don't realize that Einstein was autistic. No speech until age three. It is important to be aware that being social for autistic people might be different from the norm. Social expectations can be confusing, overwhelming, or uncomfortable. There is an autistic spectrum of being social. Here, Dr. Temple Grandin explains her way of being social. And I don't have complicated social relationships. Most of my social relationships are around shared interests. Well, I'm thinking about a two hour conversation I had on an airplane with a construction management lady. And we discussed um, concrete warehouse construction and uh, concrete forming systems. That was a really, really fun flight. There's a kind of social back and forth chit chat that I just don't do where people kind of are laughing in rhythm. It's very rapid conversation. I do not have the processor speed to follow that. What I tend to do at a party is pick out one person, we'll go talk for 15 minutes, and I've learned not to talk their head off, and then I'll talk to another person. Neurodivergent people have sensory sensitivities, and one that can be very sensitive is tolerating lighting. The neurodivergent people might have like sound sensitivity. Now, I'm, a sensitivity that autistic people can have, but also people with head injuries can have, is seeing flicker on LED lights. And the room will flash on and off like a strobe light. And one of the ways to find the bad lights is um, take slow motion video with your phone. And I had an interview last night with an architecture magazine. And I told them it's the single most important accommodation inside a building is to get LED lights that do not flicker. Neurodivergent people have learning differences. These can be in math, reading, communication, or more. Here, Dr. Grandin talks about her work with her mother to learn to read. I did not read when I was eight years old. I was in third grade. I was not picking up sight words. So my mother taught me to read by getting a book that I really liked. It's called The Wizard of Oz. And she taught me how to sound out my words with phonics. It was all done out loud. And uh, she'd read a page of the book, stop in a really interesting part, and then I would sound out maybe three or four words. And then gradually she read less and less, and I read more and more. And in just a few months, I went from no reading to a sixth grade or rather 12 year old level reading. So let's try, you know, phonetic methods on, because some kids learn by sight words, you know, dog, cat, apple. Other students learn by sounding out their words. Try both methods. 
Dr. Grandin provides more suggestions for accommodating learning differences by being aware of the cognitive load of processing long sentences of spoken language. Pausing for processing and providing written instructions are something anyone can do to help. Now, uh, one of the places where I would have problems is I have very bad working memory. And I do not remember long strings of verbal instruction. So if there's a task with a sequence that's being presented verbally, I'm going to remember it better if I can make a checklist of the steps. It's a very simple, easy accommodation, and it would greatly help. It would also help a lot of autistic people to keep jobs. So let's say they're showing you how to clean an ice cream machine. You'd have the steps to take it apart, the steps to clean, the steps to reassemble. And we need to remind the school that for pilots on airlines, they are required to use the checklist every single flight. Something that Dr. Temple Grandin highlights is that people feel pride when they have a job. Here she talks about celebrating neurodiversity and celebrating the accomplishments one person at a time, really drawing attention to unique abilities of each individual. The way to discover talent, and Michelangelo was probably autistic. Michelangelo dropped out of school at age 12, but he was exposed to great art. He was running around in all these churches that were commissioning great art. He also knew stone cutting. So that's exposure. He saw the great art and he had the tools to make it. The only way, you know, how can a child find out they're good at music if they don't have musical instruments? I had a little flute. I never figured out how to play it. But another child pick up that flute and just play it. Students have to be exposed to a lot of stuff. And then they can find out what they're good at. Michelangelo would not have made David if he had not had stone cutting tools as a child. We have a huge shortage, let's say, of my kind of mind to, to fix things like elevators. I've been on many elevators recently that I know have not been serviced. And for some you know, visual thinker like me, we love fixing elevators. We have broken escalators all over the airports. They're not getting fixed. You know, these are places where, for my kind of mind, they're really good jobs. They are not going to get replaced by computers. And then you have the computer jobs, like the people who are going to figure out the next AI system. There's musicians that I know are autistic. There's famous musicians that are autistic, and they've been public about it. Elon Musk has come out that he's autistic. By discovering neurodivergent people's strengths, and then supporting careers based on those strengths, Dr. Temple Grandin illustrates a path towards celebrating neurodiversity. Things like the uh, auto repairs, this is one person that started it. One person started a coffee shop and hired people with disabilities, and it became a favorite neighborhood coffee shop. Or to, I guess in Japan, it'd be a tea shop in Japan. But uh, it's the same thing. I mean, these are, these are specific examples of things that were highly successful. In considering ever-evolving technical advancements, Dr. Grandin weighs in on the pros and cons of AI and circles back to the role of the human in the loop in artificial intelligence chatbots. I'm very concerned about the way ChatGPT makes things up. Okay, it did a beautiful job of summarizing one of my articles on cattle handling. I asked it to do that. It did a beautiful job. But then if there's not enough data in the database that it's trained on, then it hallucinates and it makes things up. Regarding mechanical systems that rely on artificial intelligence, Dr. Grandin reminds us of the important role of mechanics, suggesting that people who think mechanically are needed to ensure human oversight in these systems. There's certain very important infrastructure that needs to have old-fashioned mechanical shutoffs. So if a rogue computer tells a piece of equipment to burn up by getting too hot, to break itself by spinning too fast, or to break because it has too much pressure, 
big expensive infrastructure. Okay, if you run a pump dry and a water works, you'll wreck the pump. Well, you can put a flow meter in there, and if it stops turning, it shuts down. Old fashioned, 50 style auto shutoffs. In terms of advocacy, Dr. Grandin's suggestion is that we make sure we're not too abstract in our actions, but we actually make it concrete and personal for the people who have power to change the laws. And here's her example. I think a lot of the advocacy you might be doing is too abstract. One of the ways I get to stay out of a lot of the controversies is let's talk about that person who will make sure you don't get stuck in an elevator. And politicians in a big building can relate to that. You know, things like that, specific things that they can really relate to. You'd like to have your computer work. Well, it might be somebody with autism is going to help you keep it working. The purpose of this video is to introduce Dr. Temple Grandin and her life experiences, as well as talk about supporting the neurodiversity movement that is occurring in Japan. To share about the culture of Japan, Dr. Joey Ito described some cultural differences between the U.S. and Japan and how new voices are emerging, such as Japan's Yuki Ichida. You were one of the first real self-advocates that came out, and I think you moved the movement forward uh, uh, so much, and you're still a, a huge inspiration for everyone. And Japan is still very behind. Um, as Yuki said, most people don't come out, and there is no visible self-advocate in Japan that's well-known, uh, like you were in the U.S. and really started this whole movement. And I know Japan and the U.S. are quite different, but I think Yuki is potentially one of the up-and-coming self-advocates who are going to be um, giving a voice. Well, that's good, and that is good. I want to, I want to encourage them. Now, in my 20s, if you saw the HBO movie about me, the, you saw projects I designed. You know what motivated me in my 20s? I wanted to prove I was not stupid. That was a very, very big thing. Prove I was not stupid. And and people thought it was weird, but nobody in the when I was in my twenties even knew I was autistic. You know, right now I'm I'm old now, I'm in my seventies. And I wanna encourage, you know, the younger generation. I because the thing is we need the skills.